dear colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. We hope that you and your families are well. On behalf of Pulsar team, we are happy to welcome you to our 17th Pulsar webinar entitled Public Sector Accounting Reform Status in Pulsar Countries. The key objectives of this event are to present the key findings of the book, discuss the current status of public sector accounting reform implementation in Pulsar countries, and share main challenges and lessons learned of the public sector accounting reform implementation in Pulsar countries. In order to achieve the proposed objectives, we have a tight agenda and a group of renowned experts who are directly or indirectly involved in development of this book. I would like to remind you that all presentations, including the translation, will be briefly available on our Pulsar website. Please also feel free to post any questions you might have using your preferred language directly in the chat. Without further ado, I pass the floor to Daniel Boyce, Practice Manager for the Governance Team for East Europe and Central Asia, to share with us some opening remarks. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, welcome, everyone, or good morning or good evening. Um, on behalf of the World Bank uh, and the Pulsar, Pulsar uh, FinCop and EduCop, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you. This is our last uh, Pulsar webinar of the fiscal year, uh, which we also call the Smart Interactive Talks. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for allocating your time. Uh, it's a, certainly a busy time of year here at the World Bank, and, and we hope that uh, all of you are doing well and your families are, are uh, also doing well during these difficult times in many countries. Today's topic is the presentation of the book on public sector accounting status in Pulsar countries, which uh, Dimitri had a leadership role in. Uh, it was recently finalized by our FinCOP and the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, Zhao uh, teams and it's based on the inputs received from uh, nearly all the Pulsar countries. Um, the main objective of the book is to share <clears throat> stories that were prepared by the countries themselves, 12 out of the 13 Pulsar countries, uh, within a harmonized format that the, the FinCOP uh, provided. So today uh, we want to discuss the relevance of the continuation of the PSA reforms uh, within the Pulsar community and also uh, see the, the positive impacts in general in terms of transparency and accountability uh, in the countries. This is really something that we have, I'd say gradually uh, moved to uh, for a long time in public sector accounting. Uh, when we talked about it in the World Bank, it was uh, about how to adopt it, how to uh, get started uh, and uh, even whether to adopt or not. Uh, and now the discussion is much more around implementation and uh, what's happening during implementation, uh, what are some of the challenges and, and how can it be done better? What are some of the considerations which we've had other Pulsar publications uh, on the drivers of, of reform and, and other topics that have also addressed this issue. Um, and we also uh, know that there's related topics like asset management and, and public investment and infrastructure that uh, public that that accrual accounting can can make a good contribution to. According to the IMF, uh, which uh, countries that use high quality accrual based information are economically more successful than those that are only accounting for a budget execution, uh, and uh, we've seen the number of countries implementing accrual accounting in general and using IPSAs as a principal reference has increased significantly over the last decade. Um, Pulsar beneficiary countries are no exception and uh, they've followed the global trends, maybe moved even faster. As you'll see in a few minutes, the book shows uh, that a clear majority of the Pulsar countries are in some sort of transition process from cash to accrual accounting. Uh, and within this process, the IPSAs play a crucial role which is uh, diverse, uh, ranges from adopting IPSAs directly as national standards to adopting them indirectly, considering them uh, sometimes mainly as a reference point for the development of the national accounting uh, principles and, and framework. It should be noted, though, that 
the PSR, PSA reforms are uh, progressing in one way or another in all the Pulsar beneficiary countries. And the experiences shared by the countries in this book uh, will continue to evolve. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot of uh, where the countries are. Uh, and I should say it doesn't only talk about uh, accrual accounting. As you'll see in the different chapters, there's a, a quite a lot of background information uh, on, on the country itself, the public administration system and so on. And so it, it helps to frame where the accounting system fits and the accounting reforms uh, within what's happening in each country and, and the institutional framework of that uh, country. So again, I, I'd like to appreciate uh, all the speakers and the guests and the participants that have joined today. I hope you'll enjoy the event and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next year when we get started with the next round of the Pulsar webinars. Back to you, Dimitri, and we'll continue. Thank you, Dan. Now I would like to invite Yen and Ross to share the key global trends and opportunities in terms of implementation of public sector accounting reforms. So thank you, Dimitri. Um, Ross and I are going to share the um, uh, session um, uh, this morning, but um, certainly thank you very much to uh, Dan for the introduction. I think, you know, the, the sorts of things that you, you've highlighted there are um, extremely relevant in terms of the growing levels of implementation and really much more focus on the challenges around that area. Um, across the regions of the world, rather than, um, you know, if you like, just the theory of where you, whether you should um, adopt uh, the standards or not. And I think, um, you know, from a standard set of point of view, um, with the increasing contact we're having, that's really important from our point of view as the UPSAS suite uh, becomes progressively more complete with a number of important projects due to be finishing in the next uh let's say 18 months or so, um, that feedback on how things are working in practice really is beginning to strongly influence our work. Um, so this is a very important area. And this is really the value of the International Public Sector Financial Accountability Index, uh, which um, has been taken forward as a joint project between um, the International Federation of Accountants, IFAC, who support IPSASB's activities, and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, SIPFA. Um, the original index um, was uh, compiled back in um, 2018, um, again as a partnership between the, the two bodies. And that was the first time ever that you had a global picture of um, what's going on in terms of the moves to accrual reporting and the ways in which IPSAS is being used around the world. And, and you know, as, as with anything, you um, refine as you go forwards. But I think it was, it, it really gave some very interesting information and showed a strong upward trend. So we updated uh, that and the report that was published uh, just around about a year ago uh, was looking at the situation in countries um, based on the evidence available in 2020, looking forward to what we called forecasts for 2025. So in countries that were expecting to be on accrual by 2025, we were looking for evidence in terms of project plans that they would actually achieve um, the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the forecast position by the end of 2025. And then we were looking uh, forward in terms of those countries uh, expecting to be on accrual based on active projects by 2030. But that difference between forecasts and projections, uh, the um, amount of data in the survey um, increased in terms of 165 jurisdictions in 2020 compared with 150 in 2018. And, um, you know, in in line with the uh, methodology adopted in the Pulsar report, we were looking at two dimensions. So the first dimension being what's the reporting basis? Um, is it full accrual? Is it cash? Is it somewhere in between? And it's very interesting reading the report. Um, that shows you there's very much a spectrum. Um, so sometimes it's quite difficult to draw a line between cash and partial accrual. Um, in particular, but also uh, accrual as well presents challenges. Then the framework that's being used um, and the extensive usage of Ipsos 
Um, and in that report, we also um, uh, gave a, a foreshadowed the new pathways to accrual model um, that has now actually been launched. It was launched in February uh, this year. Um, by uh, IFAC and, and the idea there is that that's a portal for sharing um, perspectives on the overall reform program but also practical examples and if uh, you haven't yet seen that uh, I would suggest uh, actually googling pathways to accrual um, there's a lot of useful information in there so just looking then at the um, update that we did obviously one of the key limitations is actually talking to the right people um, you know one of the challenges we had was that we you know we general data protection requirements came in between 2018 2020 um, so challenges in terms of actually just could we use existing contacts and changes um, a lot of change um, uh, between years. Um, so if you can bring up the next bullet points, um, Ross. So we did change the uh, questions that we asked um, between 2018 and 2020. Um, particularly, we cut out a lot of information, a lot of requests for information around budgeting, which weren't well answered in the first uh, index questionnaire, and um, some issues around rebuilding the, uh, the back end of the model. Um, but Overall, um, a lot of work put into both 2018 and 2020 to data verification. Of course, timing wise, it was very unfortunate that we kicked off the exercise just as the pandemic got going. And so that became a very elongated exercise taking uh, more than a year to achieve that, that coverage. And I think, you know, um, really, um, the, the challenges are around evidence. And you can see in the report, um, there's a lot of nuanced judgments that you need to make um, in terms of both the reporting framework and the basis of reporting. And trying to look for evidence, particularly on accrual reporting. Um, so that's, that's, in some cases, you, you do get differences in views in terms of where a country actually is at a particular point in time. We deliberately set the bar high in terms of accrual, um, if you like, being the most stringent category, really looking for published accounts. Um, and, um, you know, certainly in the past, some controversy where countries have been in a transition year in the year in which the index data was collected, but we tried to take a, a strong view on that and look at a set of accounts that actually looked like it was um, on an accrual basis. Um, and uh, very much this evidence, not just well, the legal framework says that, what's actually happening in practice. Um, I think it's easier to see um, the what's the, the sort of basis than it is the way uh, that IPSAS is being used. Obviously, there are there, there tend to be nuances in that, and you can see that from the report. Um, so some tricky judgments at times. Anyhow, so what, what was the picture in 2020? Well, um, the picture in 2020 was 30% um, on accrual, 30% on cash, 40% partial accrual. That was a rise of 6% uh, between the 2018 index and the uh, 2020 index, allowing for changes in composition. Um, and um, just discussing the nuances in terms of financial reporting framework, what we did was we firmed up on a, a typology, which again is used in the uh, Pulsar report. Um, Ipsas with no modification, that's where the standards are being used directly. And that's what we see uh, in countries like, say, Tanzania, um, or um, in the UN system. So they take the standards directly, no endorsement process. Um, the next category, the dark blue, um, is IPSAS modified um, for the um, uh, jurisdiction context. And that's where you have some form of endorsement process uh, that uh, goes on, which may result in some modifications, it may not, but certainly you see that in countries like Malaysia and the Philippines, as an example. Um, national standards with reference to IPSAS is where there are the, the national framework is certainly influenced by uh, key IPSAS on public sector topics. 
but not overtly in terms of the formal endorsement process. And then you have certain jurisdictions where they start off from IFRS, which of course Ipsos do in many cases, um, but um, IFRS is the, um, the stated framework, that's three jurisdictions. Um, and then you have national standards other and those may be bespoke standards created for a jurisdiction. Um, you have that situation, for example, in France. Um, so a range there. Um, and really the challenge is actually, how do you actually allocate both in terms of the reporting basis and the framework within that uh, typology? And I think at that point in time, um, Ross, I'll hand over to you to start talking about the global trends that we saw across the years, having looked at the actual 2020 results. Yeah, thanks, Ian. And I'll uh, just uh, get the slide going here. So I'll talk a little bit, as Ian said, about the global trends and then drill down on some information we have on uh, the Pulsar Country region. Um, firstly, as Ian said, um, and the data played out in this way, there is a significant uh, forecast and projection for shift to accrual uh, from 2020 to 2030, with 30% uh, of jurisdictions reporting on accrual in 2020, moving to 50% in 2025, and all the way to 73% in 2030. And that's of the 165 countries surveyed in the index. So that is a significant amount of uh, movement uh, in a short period of time. And related to that also, you see a significant decrease in those countries reporting on cash that you would expect. Um, the real challenge I think that, that the countries are gonna face that are in that middle bucket partial accrual over the next few years is really sustaining the momentum of, of their uh, transition programs and making sure that they move out of that partial accrual bucket into accrual on time. So as we move forward and, and keep tabs on progression, that'll be one of the things we'll be watching in, as we update the index going forward and um, you know think about future updates, which I'll talk about a little bit more uh, further on. But I, I did think it was interesting to note that uh, the findings on a global trend mirror those uh, that are captured for the Pulsar countries in the public sector accounting reform uh, status update for the Pulsar country report that um, we're talking about today. And it's great to see that trend. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a couple slides. Before we get into that, I did want to drill down a little deeper on, on some of the, the insights related to accrual adoption and the use of IPSAs. Um, and Ian's already highlighted this first uh, circle as of 2020, so I won't spend a lot of time there. I'm going to focus on 2025 and 2030 and start to drill down there. Um, so it's interesting to see that in the index, we found that um, a, a significant shift in 2025 for jurisdictions moving to accrual and the increasing use of IPSAs in some way. So 73% of the jurisdictions in 2025 that are moving to accrual will make use of IPSAs in some way. Uh, and again, that's quite an increase from 2020. And we see that trend continue in 2030 of the 120 jurisdictions projected to be on accrual by 2030, 81% or 97 jurisdictions will be using IPSAs in some way. And even when you drill down into that, and look at direct, direct adoption of IPSAs. In 2025, 16 of the jurisdictions uh, surveyed would be using uh, IPSAs directly. By 2030, that'll increase to 31, um, which is great to see overall. But I think it shows and confirms that as jurisdictions move to accrual, they're increasingly looking to the international standards as the baseline to do so. And from a public um, financial management reform um, perspective, I think that's quite positive because you'll start to see more comparability between different countries and the basis for their accounting, which is helpful for, for public management. And as Daniel noted in, in his opening that, um, you know, reports uh, completed by the IMF a few years ago strongly show that uh, those jurisdictions that adopt a high quality accrual accounting um, system tend to have uh, greater economic activity and uh, benefits overall. So, you know, it is a good trend to highlight and an important one. And, and again, I'll dig down in the next few slides on what we found in the Pulsar countries um, at a high level. So here's the, the 2020 
uh, index capture of the Pulsar countries at that time. And as you can see in the public sector accounting reform status report in Pulsar countries, there's already been some positive movement since 2020. And again, that's great to see. Uh, the index itself is a snapshot in time. Uh, and again, we work to keep it up to date and can make updates periodically. But, um, you know, it really is meant to capture at a point in time and then project forward so we can see what the trends are. Um, and just a note here, and I'll mention this again later, if if the 2020 index wasn't accurately capturing your, your jurisdiction and you'd like us to take another look at it, we can update the index periodically, but you need to provide us with some evidence on the progress of your reforms uh, and answer a few questions from the survey that we completed in 2020 so that we have the basis to update the index. Again, um, it's important to the integrity of the index that we make sure that we have uh, evidence of progress on reforms before we update the index. And again, we do it on a survey basis and on the evidence we have at the time. So again, more than happy to take another look at any jurisdictions. You just have to contact us and provide uh, some evidence and answer some questions. So moving on and digging a little deeper um, on the index and particularly for, for the Pulsar countries, um, not a whole lot I wanna say on this other than you know, if you looked at the trends a few slides ago on the global trends, uh, I think it's quite positive that we're seeing the same trend here in the, the Pulsar countries. Um, but more positively, I would say, if you look at 2020, the number of countries on accrual and, and the general uh, outlook for the Pulsar countries was probably a little behind the global trend in terms of number of countries on accrual. But by 2030, it kind of flips to the other side and you're seeing a more positive picture with no countries projected to be on cash any longer, 77% on accrual, and only a couple left in that partial accrual bucket. Um, and I think that's quite positive. That's a lot of progress in a short period of time. And I would say that credit should go to the countries and their, their PSA reform programs. And I think uh, it's a credit to the Pulsar program and the regional support being provided that allows countries to move so quickly. Um, I can tell you from other jurisdictions that we've engaged with, um, this is quite a significant shift in cash to accrual in a short period of time and even partial accrual to accrual. So again, they're just forecasts and trends. Um, hopefully they take root, but based on the, the publication we're talking about today, I think it's already showing that um, most of the countries are, are well on target, if not ahead of target, which again is very encouraging. And then I wanted to do, a, a, again, a little bit of a dive specifically on the Pulsar countries and the use of IPSAs. And again, similar to the global trends, um, we are seeing increasing usage of IPSAs in some way in, in all of the Pulsar countries as they move towards accrual. And if we look forward uh, to 2030, a very positive trend in my view, again, I'm biased, I work for the IPSASB, but, um, all the 10 jurisdictions that are projected to be on accrual will be making use of IPSAs in some way. Uh, and even more positive, I think, is the direct and indirect adoption of IPSAs. Um, again, this is a little bit ahead of the global trend. And again, just great to see. I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, the more you, we see countries adopting a standardized international approach, the more comparability you get. And we think an, an overall trend that that's positive for everyone involved. So just. Um, another highlight on the Pulsar countries in that sense. And then moving to the next steps. So where are we going with the index? Uh, how are we gonna keep it up to date? Um, as I mentioned briefly before, we can do periodic updates. So the index is supported by a global map um, that, that unlike the status reports we do is not static. When we have a change uh, in the status of a country and we're provided with evidence, we can update that map from time to time. Again, you'll just need to answer some questions and provide that data, and then we'll update the map on the website that supports the index. Um, in terms of our next more complete update, uh, in 2023, the IPSASB will, will be going out to our constituents to consult on a number of important strategic matters, principally our next strategy and work program from 2024 to 2028. And when we do those, those um those outreach events, we will be looking to gather uh, data on, on the index 
through those events and working with our partners. So we will most definitely reach out to uh, the Pulsar group and work with the Pulsar team to try and get updates as of 2023 for all of the, the countries in the Pulsar program. Um, again, uh, we'll be building on the same data points that we captured in the last status update, um, and there will be minimal changes to the questions. I think we're, we've standardized uh, the information that we'd like to capture. There will be a bit of a focus on jurisdictional coverage where we have gaps. So thankfully, because of the Pulsar program in the Pulsar region, we don't have a lot of gaps um, because we've been provided with good information. But in other jurisdictions, we're not as lucky. And uh, in, in parts of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, we do have quite a bit of uh, information gaps at the moment that we will be looking to, to fill and focus on in 2023. That's not to say we won't do updates for countries that we do have information on where there is a change in status and we can gather that information. We will definitely do those updates at the same time. Um, the last point I won't spend a lot of time on, but when the index was was kind of uh, thought up, at first we thought we'd focus on the federal national level and then in the future we'd, we'd push that down to uh, um, lower levels of government, so state, provincial, even municipalities. Uh, for the time being, we've kind of put that on hold as we continue to work to, with the struggles of getting the information at a federal national level. That's not to say at some point in the future, we might not look to expand and, and do uh, drill downs into lower levels of government, but until we've really um, captured and made the progress at the federal level, um, we've made a decision or or the team that that does the the index has made a decision that it's it's better to put that on hold for the time being. And with that, that brings us to the end of the the global trends update and and the highlight of the index. And again, very, very encouraged to see the report that we're speaking about today and the great progress of of the trends on IPSA's adoption and, and accrual adoption in the pulsar countries. And with that, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and turn it back to you, Dimitri. Thank you, Jen Rose. Our next speaker is Christoph Schuller, who is join, jointly with Andres Bergman, participated in putting together the inputs received from different countries and drawing the conclusions about what is currently happening in Pulsar countries in terms of implementation of public sector accounting reform. Unfortunately, Andres wasn't able to join us today. Uh, thus, Christoph and I decided to prepare a joint presentation on the main findings and lessons learned from the book. Christoph, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. And um, uh, thank you um, for providing us with the opportunity to join uh, this uh, this talk today. And greeting from Andreas. Uh, uh, yeah, he unfortunately can't be here today. And also from Sandra Fuchs, who also helped in, in uh, preparing the book as part of our team from Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And uh, I just saw that we have a few people from the Focal group joining, so benvenidos and um, uh, happy to uh, also uh, see you here. So um, let's start. Uh, now it works, all right. So, um, as Dimitri mentioned, uh, we're going to share uh, this presentation and uh, what, what we'll, be, we'll be talking about in the coming 20 to 30 minutes, uh, the objectives and scope of the Pulsar program in general, uh, some key findings uh, from the book, uh, the status, uh, Ross and Ian already uh, mentioned some, some of the highlights and we'll, we'll dig a bit uh, deeper into that. And then in the second part, uh, Dimitri will present some of the main challenges, the lessons learned, and also the way forward, what would be uh, the next step uh, to continue on this, uh, on this road. So uh, the objectives uh, more general from the, uh, uh, from the Pulsar program, as, as you all I'm sure are aware of, support national and subnational governments in developing efficient and effective PSA systems. And how, how does the Pulsar program do that? Um, so Andreas and, and I particularly, we have been involved in, in many uh, knowledge products um, as of today, uh, and I'm sure uh, you are 
uh, also familiar with some of the of the technical notes um, uh, we've produced, uh, being it on asset management, on GFS integration, or on reform roadmaps more in general. So this is one element to uh, uh, to help uh, public sector entities and governments in general um, to to further develop the PSA system. Um, a few years ago, we did the stock take study um, in in the Pulsar region. To see or to get a better picture, uh, where where all the countries and jurisdictions stand, and and what what would be the most appropriate way forward, and it also it already showed some of the gaps between uh, national and, and international uh, PSA frameworks, and the latest product maybe um, Dimitri will mention it again, and uh, some of you might have had to have attended in April um, the last interactive talk on the Pulse Handbook. Um, so this will help uh, not only the Pulsar countries, but on a global level, uh, countries and jurisdictions um, to, to get a, a clear sense of where they stand in terms of, uh, of gaps between uh, the national PSA framework and, and IPSAS. So still on a, on a general level, um, key findings um, that you also can, can see in the book. So. Uh, uh, both Dan and and Ross, I think, also mentioned some of the some of the benefits when implementing accrual uh, accrual accounting systems um, or IPSAS in particular, uh, improving the quality of of public service in general, uh, enduring uh, fiscal stability for the promotion of national economic growth, but also uh, accrual accounting systems allow for better interaction between between the government and citizens, and therefore it can improve or increase the acceptability and the credibility of governments and its decisions. Uh, overall, the implementation, uh, we've associated it here with, with three uh, overarching topics. Transparency, so implementing accrual accounting systems, um, standards like, like IPSAS. It gives you a more complete picture of, of your public finances uh, and not also from, from an accounting perspective, but also can give you a better uh, basis for, for financial statistics. It provides accountability, uh, with, with, uh, which then in turn could enhance the political participation and inclusiveness. Again, dialogue between, um, well, not only citizens, but also with, with the legislative body and, and the government, and also uh, consequently can improve trust in governments. And, in general, it will improve financial management uh, as it might improve, uh, or, uh, in, in most cases, does improve the management of fiscal risks, uh, for, inten for, for example, contin contingent liabilities or uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, so this is also related to the, uh, to the transparency element. Now, um, focusing more on the, on the Pulsar beneficiary countries, what we've seen in the book uh, and also also in previous uh, studies that local context matters. So each country is presented with, with a different set of opportunities, but also uh, depending on, on, on the local circumstances on a, on a different set of challenges. As a result, all countries are, although all countries are progressing towards accrual accounting, they do so at a, at a different speed. Um, with, with different steps to take. However, what we've seen is that IPSAS, and uh, I think this, this plays well into what, what Ross has mentioned before, that uh, IPSAS plays a central role in all, uh, in all reform programs. And I think that's also probably where, where, uh, uh, where the forecast and the projections is based on, and where we see that, uh, that we see a high level of IPSAS implementation as well, uh, that we that the plan is that we uh, that none of the Pulsar countries will be uh, uh, will no longer be on cash basis by 2030, and um, but what we see is uh, both direct and indirect approaches. I think this matches as well what what Ross has mentioned before, and each jurisdiction is at the at the different stage uh, in terms of the of the adoption process, and. I've seen before Ross uh, the information from the from the indexes from 2020. Uh, if I'm right, um, our information or what the, the the bulk of the data that we've collected was from 2021. Um, so there might be some some differences. 
Um, and I think uh, also in some cases a move forward towards uh, towards accrual accounting and and IPSIS uh, implementation, which we'll see on the next slide. But we can see here clearly uh, the majority of countries is already either uh, on a partial accrual basis or already on a on a full accrual basis. And in terms of implementation status. Uh, all but one uh, jurisdiction have either already adopted or have uh, have the adoption planned. Uh, so there's a there's a large majority, um, and and we can see here that the, the indirect adoption, uh, when we look at the, at the adoption strategies, is the more popular one, and uh, we'll see how that will uh, uh, will play out in the future if if this percentage stays or if we see more uh, more uh, direct adoptions as um, uh, as forecasted by uh, by the index. Well, based based on the information that we've got in the in the book, uh, we uh, we were able to sort of uh, group all the all the countries and jurisdictions in in two stages. Um, those in the early stage were the countries with either no or with a planned adoption, so those uh, in red and yellow, and then we have the advanced stage, uh, which already have a direct or indirect adoption and are either still in, in the process or a few countries are also almost finished with, uh, with the IPSAS adoption, uh, those countries in blue and green. And with that, I'll hand over to Dimitri. Thank you, Christoph. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the main challenges, uh, some recommendations, uh, lesson learned, we identified while we were working on the book. Uh, and in terms of the challenges, um, as it was mentioned already, the use of it as a direct or indirect method uh, for IPSIS implementation present different challenges. Uh, for instance, country adopting IPSIS indirectly through national standards, general affairs and early challenge in development of those national standards, but tend to find the implementation easier later on. In turn, countries adopting, adopting IPSAS directly find it relatively easy to adopt IPSAS at the beginning, but challenges are more likely at a later stage when the standards have to be actually implemented. In both scenarios, the new standards require a sound legal basis, which in some cases needs to be created and in another uh, just updated. We're going to see it also in lesson learned. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, further main challenges identified were the need for capacity building and staff training. And you know that it's one of the main obstacles in implementation, not only public sector accounting reform, but any reform. And that is true. Uh, uh, this is why we have also another community of practice in Pulsar called EDUCOP, which is uh, precisely focused on uh, strengthening capacity building and provide, providing different training resources and opportunity for, for our colleagues. Need for technical assistance is another challenge, which implies a, uh, it's related to the first one, given that there is no enough uh, trained staff uh, at the beginning of the reform, uh, many countries uh, face the need to, to get for involved international ex experts and consultants to start with the implementation of public sector accounting. Lack of effective program management, it's another very important issue. It's very important to have uh, proper uh, reform implementation and coordination arrangements, including uh, implementation coordination units and also in some cases steering committees that would supervise and monitor the progress made uh, in terms of reform implementation. Lack of adequate, adequate IT infrastructure is another big issue, especially if uh, international financial integrated financial management information system, IFMIS, need to be uh, developed and implemented. And it's a whole reform by itself. Uh, high cost of reform implementation, which is also related to to the previous point, especially if you need to implement IFMIS, the cost of the public sector country reform could increase drastically. Uh, there, in some occasions, there could be conflicts between international standards and local legislation and context, 
this is why updating uh, legal framework uh, in timely fashion is very important. <clears throat> Another obstacle is the limited availability of financial data, uh, uh, which make uh, difficult to move forward with the, with the public sector accounting reform and present re reliable financial data at the beginning. And uh, finally, institutional resistance, uh, which also is very important uh, challenge, which includes uh, which includes resistance to change, and we can uh, see it not only in public sector accounting reform, but in all major public financial management reform. Next time, some of the lessons learned and recommendations include. <clears throat> <clears throat> political support and willingness from the key, key stakeholders uh, to, to initiate and carry out the reforms uh, that should be secured and maintained. This is very important because we can see that sometimes it's good timing to start the reform and the minister is supportive and sometimes even the president or somebody from the presidential office and Congress are involved. But over the time, um, maybe after the elections, after the, the current administration changes, the impulse could be weakened. So it's very important to ensure that political support and willingness uh, keep um, key, uh, is there uh, throughout the, the whole period of reform implementation. Reform strategy and feasible implementation time should be developed and agreed on before the starting the actual implementation. This is also important uh, because some countries try to start implementation without actually having a comprehensive, comprehensive reform strategy in the feasible implementation timeline is another issue. Um, many countries um, have um, optimistic approach and think that in two, three years, they will be able to implement all the IPSAs so or uh, or, or, or the accrual accounting basis. And in practice, many times it's a little bit more challenging and complicated. And uh, in, in general, the implementation of public sector accounting reform take at least five years and, and more. Proper reform coordination and management arrangements should be established. We mentioned that in, it's one of the challenges, but it's also one of the recommendations. Uh, financial and human resources required for the reform should be secured. We talk about importance of having uh, required resources, not only in terms of the uh, financial cost, but also the human resources and the capacity building in the training is very important here uh, to start building your own institutional capacity, uh, uh, which would allow you to avoid uh, excessive dependence on international expertise and, and consultants. Legal and regulatory framework should be timely updated. Uh, ideally before starting the reform or the first uh, stages of the reform implementation. And sometimes it could be at more operative level like accounting manuals, but um, sometimes some, slow, some laws should be revised or even the constitution. So that obviously bring another level of challenge to the public sector accounting reform. Next slide. Some additional lesson learned and recommendation consists of uh, uh, the importance of defining structure of the new public sector accounting system. And we're talking here about mainly uh, whether the accounting recording will be done centrally uh, or at the de decentralized level, or maybe the government will hire a third party to, to do some or most of the accounting. So this like macro, uh, definition of the new public sector accounting system should be defined timely before starting the reform. The risk management and mitigation mechanisms should be identified and established. Established. It also has with the uh, uh, resistance change. is is important to monitor what are, what are the bottlenecks of the reform implementation and what mitigation mechanisms could be adopted and to ensure that the reform progress. Uh, uh, continues. Change management and capacity building strategies should be timely developed and implemented beforehand. Uh, and we, here we're talking about both things, uh, resistance to change and, and training strategies. So 
Uh, we could also include uh, internal external communication plan here because it's important to raise awareness of the reform uh, among other public sector officials, not only those directly involved in, in the accounting. Integration between different public financial management functions and upgrading the existing or developing uh, integrated financial management information system uh, is also a, a priority. Um, it will be very difficult to continue with the modern public sector accounting system doing it manually and specifically, for instance, I'm talking about consolidation. So implementation of a, um, of a modern uh, IFMIS, uh, it's one of the important things that is also cross-cutting for public financial management reform and including public sector accounting. And finally, reform monitoring and evaluation arrangements should be also established uh, for both during the reform implementation and uh, even after the reform uh, has been already implemented. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an, uh, the last slide of the presentation. And in terms of the next steps, um, uh, as Christopher already mentioned, the difference in the current reform status for each jurisdiction directly affects the next steps for each jurisdiction uh, that should be taken. So it's, it's difficult to have a magical recipe for all countries or for all jurisdictions in terms of the next steps in the reform strategy. However, the pulse assessment that was presented in, in April, in April uh, could help uh, uh, the countries to identify the current status of the reform as well as the main areas for improvement. Uh, and the best way to deal with the challenges identified uh, is through, uh, through uh, development and preservation of the following four sets of capacities political, institutional, technical, and human. And if you see the, uh, uh, the lesson learned, the recommendation, all of them could be combined and classified in one of these uh, set of capacities. Addressing de and developing and maintaining all four sets of capacity will, be, uh, will build a strong foundation, allowing not only for continuation in the reform process, but also to sustain reform progress and outcomes. Uh, that would be all uh, on our end. We can end the 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 screen sharing. Uh, now we're going to have a section um, on country experiences, and I wonder if Drit and Fino is already connected. If not. Uh, we would ask Firuze to start with the presentation of Azerbaijan experience. Firuze, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Then maybe we will begin with you. Дайте мне знать, если вы хотите, чтобы я вашу презентацию открыл. Мне начинать уже? Ну, давайте я открою презентацию, и вы, и вы начнете. Секундочку. Ферузе, может быть... Давайте, э, давайте закройте ваши и вашу презентацию. Uh, maybe you can close your uh, presentation and let me open the English version so that um, our participants could understand. Um, okay, are you ready? Can I continue? Uh, yes, please tell me if uh, you can see the slides. Yes, I can. Okay, then, thank you. Let's continue. Reforms that are currently carried out 
in the Republic of Azerbaijan in the field of accounting. As a result of uh, the adoption of the law, the Republic of Azerbaijan on accounting, 2004, the country began the process of introducing international financial reporting standards. We began the process of um, implementation of uh, national accounting standards for commercial organizations developed based on IFRS, as well as national accounting standards for budgetary organizations based on IPSAS. As a result, organizations began preparing financial statements in accordance with these above mentioned standards. Thus, the implementation of um, a unified state accounting policy led to fundamental changes in this domain. As a result, of um, accounting reforms and um, transformation aimed um, to achieve um, compliance with international accounting standards. The following important measures are being introduced. Modern accounting and reporting models, new centralized user-friendly information systems to automate all the reporting process. Um, and um, uh, this is a very important event to facilitate a higher level of automated reporting. The special system was created, financial and accounting reports for budgetary organizations. And um, that allowed um, the companies to report based on IFRS, based on the standards, uh, and these reports now can be submitted automatically and in timely manner in order to continue reforms and transformation that uh, began with the passing of the law on accounting in 2004. Uh, this um, uh, law of 2004 was amended uh, by a new law in um, 2018, and this new law provides for full transformation to IFRS uh, in um, local adaptation and adoption of new accounting rules. And I think we lost our speaker. Oh, here she is. Okay, according uh, to the law, three types of international standards are applied. That would be international financial reporting standards, international financial reporting standards for small and medium businesses, international public sector accounting standards. And um, the law requires application of accounting rules for the purposes of accounting by existing accounting entities. And that would include accounting rules based on FRS, accounting rules based on international financial reporting standards for small and medium sized businesses, and accounting rules based on international public sector accounting standards as well as rules um, of accounting for micro uh, business entities. According uh, to the law on accounting, public interest entities prepare financial statement, statements based on IFRS, and they account according to the rules um, based on IFRS. According to the law on accounting, small business entities, depending on their choice, they would prepare financial statements either based on IFRS for SMEs or according 
too full uh, for us. And these small businesses or medium-sized businesses can also follow the rules of accounting for small businesses if they prepare financial statements based on full IFRS, then they follow IFRS accounting rules. Depending on the choice of uh, medium and large uh, businesses, they prepare their reporting based on IFRS for SMEs or full IFRS. And thus, they either do accounting based on IFRS for SMEs or based on full IFRS accounting rules. According to the law on accounting, non-commercial organizations and that would include municipal bodies and budget supported organizations. They prepare their reports um, according uh, to the rules of accounting based on IPSAS. According to those standards and rules, budget and municipal organizations they fully transferred to accrual method government institutions of different subordinations they're reporting according to forums established by their relevant government authorities and uh, um, they follow um, and um, other non-commercial organizations follow IPSAS. So all the budgetary institutions have transferred into IPSAS. We have direct application of IPSAS and we have moved to accrual based accounting. In addition, according to the law on accounting, we need certificate of um, professional accountant and that would be mandatory for chief accountants of uh, state enterprises or where controlling stake belongs to the state also if it's a listed company chief accountants of budgetary organizations and chief accountants of large uh, and medium commercial organizations, as well as those that um, um, are public interest entities. They all need to have professional accountant certificate. This is our practice. That uh, is current. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa. Could you tell us about the challenges and problems that you have experienced? Maybe there are um, pieces of advice you could recommend to our colleagues in other countries. Before 2018, we had our national standards. And after 2018, when we fully transferred to application of IPSAS international standards, it was difficult. It was very difficult. But we have overcome those difficulties because direct application of IPSAS is very hard. That's why we developed rules accounting rules based on IPSAS. And these accounting rules, they were like public policy. 
state policy was presented into accounting rules based on IPSAS because all government institutions, all government subordinate institutions need to account and report according to the same principle, according to the same rules. IPSAS allows for different options and we did not want our government institutions to choose different options. It would have been very difficult for the Ministry of Finance to consolidate those various reports and uh, knowledge sharing would have been much more difficult. That's why we created a unified set of rules based on IPSAS and after those uh, rules were accepted, they're all used in our government, in our republic, and uh, the approach in accounting and reporting is practically the same for everyone. And of course, we use a method of accrual. We don't use cash uh, method. We fully transfer to um, accrual. Thank you very much. And what was your experience of working and applying integrated financial management information system? I haven't heard a question. What was our experience in, in uh, implements in the financial management system. We have developed the rules for public entities. Financial management is very important. And we have the rules for finance management. It is base, based on uh, uh, GFS. Okay, it is clear. Thank you. Jose, Jose. we have any questions from the audience while we are waiting for Dritten to connect? Uh, thanks, Dimitri. No, we, we don't have yet questions from the audience, uh, but we can, if you want, we can start and we can uh, continue when uh, the experience of Albania uh, is uh, ready to be presented. Um, so um, Natalia Konovalenko had a, a question. Uh, Natalia, can you uh, can you please proceed? Yes, thank you very much, Jose. Uh, Firuza, I have a question which uh, echoes uh, basically what Dmitry already started to ask. Uh, in your slides, you mentioned the system called FBOBO. Whether the system may be considered as IFMIS and what are its key elements and scope? So what type of information it collects, what organizations are included, and for what key purposes this um, information uh, or the system is mostly used? Uh, what kind of system? That is the system that presented at your slides. It was called FBOBO. Can the system be considered as the integrated system of financial management? And could you elaborate on the system? What kind of elements does it include? And what kind of information does it collect? What kind of organizations it includes? And for what purposes it can be used? Is it uh, integrated financial management information system, the way we understand it. I need uh, just to understand what you would like to find out, because at the slides, the slides were translated into English, and the system which you mentioned, it is FBO, right? I apologize once again. Could you repeat what kind of system we would like to discuss? At uh, the slides, uh, can you mention uh, in Russian slide? It is slide three. It is uh, second bullet point. International standards for SMEs. This is uh, what we'd like to ask. Now, we're talking about uh, financial reports and uh, accounting reports for public entities. Our public entities 
prepared a financial reports based on Ipsos, based on international public sector accounting standards. And public entities uh, do their accounting based on the rules, which are Ipsos based. Ipsos is the international standards of accounting for the public sector entities. I understand. Thank you for your answer, Firuza. So you have the software, you have the information system, which helps to prepare the reporting. If we talk about software, the software helps to do the accounting according to the Ipsos rules and also it automatically prepares financial reports, which are Ipsos based. I understand. Thank you for your answer. You're welcome. Thank you. Further, Britain was able to connect. And so, uh, if Britain is ready, we, we can proceed with the presentation from Albania. Britain, let me know if you would like to share your presentation, share the screen with your presentation, or you're going to do it on your end. Dritan, can you hear us? Uh, Dmitry, sorry, this is Irma. I think they are connecting through the room and we, uh, they need to use the attendee. They use the attendee uh, link. So we need to fix this technical issue. He's on mute. Also, he's on mute. Dritan, can you hear us? Can you unmute your system? Still muted. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, Go ahead. Then. So, Dimitri, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Sorry for the inconvenience because of uh, technical uh, technical issues. I want to apologize to everyone for for this moment. Uh, if it is possible, Dimitri, to help me with the uh, with the slides, uh, I'd uh, really appreciate it. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's really a great pleasure to to be here today and to uh, share with everyone the experience that uh, Albania is having in implementing uh, a cruel a cruel accounting. Uh, the government of Albania has, in its PFM strategy, has committed to move to rural accounting, and we are already taking uh, taking some uh, steps, or we already have, let's say, an action plan to move into that direction. Uh, uh, how is currently public accounting regulated in Albania? Uh, for the time being, we have a modified, uh, let's say, cash-based accounting, uh, which uh, the, the expenses are uh, recognized on cash basis and the revenues, some type of revenues are recognized on accrual basis. It's not that very well regulated. We do have an instruction uh, actually that uh, regulates all public accounting uh, regulation transactions in the public sector. Uh, since 2019, and this actually this uh, instruction was uh, was pre prepared as a transitionary provision before moving to uh, to IPSAS. Uh, the the uh, structure in charge, the Ministry of Finance, is the the, the responsible authority in Albania to regulate uh, accounting. Uh, in the public sector through the Department of Organization, Financial Management, Control and Accounting. 
these departments responsible for preparing the methodology and all the counting, uh, counting rules. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, the government of Albania uh, is committed to move to rural accounting. Uh, it's already prepared the convention and on, on this, on this, uh, on this regard, we've, uh, we're having some support from the World Bank to assist us to uh, implement international accounting standards or to implement international accounting practices in, a, uh, in, the, in the current uh, regulations. So we have started a project with World Bank on this since uh, 2018, and we've uh, made several uh, several progress during this time. Uh, one of the first uh, one of the first steps that we took. Uh, uh, please, next slide. Uh, the first one of the first steps we took was to prepare a gap analysis of the Albanian. Uh, uh, a uh, lot of uh, counter principles with uh, with uh, with TIPSAS. and also we took a snapshot of what was the situation in Albania at the time we started the process, and we identified that there was a lack of precise determination of number of, of, of the number of controlled public sector units. Uh, the legal framework for public sector accounting was complex, fragmented, and unclear. There is a lack in Albania of vocational education training in the field of public sector financial accounting, and there is a lack of code of ethics for public sector accountants. So it's a profession that is not really regulated. Uh, the budgeting system, uh, the confusing budget system, also adds to the complexity of the, of the systems. Uh, of course, uh, the government financial information system is plays a crucial role, and that system itself is partially functioning as it should in terms of rural accounting. Uh, although it is being used in most uh, uh, units of the public sector. And there is lack of consolidated uh, uh, asset register for general, general government units in Albania. And of course, this is also related with a lack of a, a clear uh, methodology for measurement and inventory of assets. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, taking into consideration all these findings uh, that we did, and there were, of course, a lot of, of a more detailed and more uh, comprehensive document prepared, uh, we decided to move to a accounting. We decided to change the accounting system and to use a modern system of public accounting based on international standards. And the main objectives of this reform was first to develop public sector accounting financial reporting in compliance with international public sector accounting standards. So we have to uh, develop a completely new regulatory framework, even maybe a legal uh, framework, and develop professional capacities and skills in the field of uh, uh, accounting for the Ministry of Finance and Economy and for all public sector accountants. One of the one of the as, as I showed in the previous slide, one of the uh, one of the findings is that was that uh, in Albania there were no really uh, dedicated educational programs for for finance officials, and there was uh, a lot of uh, let's say missing uh, uh, process regarding the trainings, uh, the physical passes for financial for all, just some scattered trainings, but not regulated or uh, let's say uh, uh, a formalized process. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, of course, one of the main drivers to besides the besides of the uh, besides the uh, let's say the findings of the current situation. Of course, uh, the decision to move to. Uh, Cruel accounting relates also with the benefits that this system will provide for uh, for the country itself. So not only the lack of procedure, the lack of training, but also what each us or cruel accounting will bring as a benefit for uh, for for government, for for uh, citizens, for uh, donors, for everybody involved in the interest in the in the activity of the government, and of course. The, 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 the benefits of FIPSAS are clear, great transparency and the accountability of financial decision making uh, would, would be a benefit. And of course, uh, maintaining uh, 
trust in the government through transparency and accountability is an important uh, element for maintaining democracy. Uh, and of course, complete information and accurate information would add better, would aid better decision making. Uh, for example, through understanding of all assets and liabilities is an invaluable and effective medium term planning for the government and would lead to more effective uh, public funds used to deliver improved outcomes for citizens. Uh, on the other side, the government of Albania does have a lot of relations with international partners and definitely the international community uh, would benefit for, from a reliable uh, uh, financial reporting system of the government in order to make uh, a fair right assessment of the country's financial stability and attractiveness for investments by supporting fair and more accurate credit ratings. Uh, of course, um, uh, um, Recently, the government really has been active in, 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 uh, in financial, international financial markets and definitely a better and improved financial policy framework would facilitate, uh, would facilitate and would increase trust in the government's financial, uh, financial uh, reporting and financial uh, information. And of course, it would increase and it would uh, encourage foreign direct investment. Uh, another important element regarding the benefit from, uh, from better financial reporting framework uh, relates to the transparency, which I, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which I mentioned a little bit uh, higher, but in this regard, uh, would help to, uh, let's say, to initiate uh, relevant debates from the public and civil society regarding the uh, uh, the financial uh, information of the government. Uh, this would add more scrutiny to uh, to more inform informative debate on the sustainability of public finances and uh, would, uh, let's say, improve the debate on how better the government to use the immediate resources and provide best outcomes for the, for the citizens. Uh, uh, next slide, please. In this, in this situation, uh, we then started the activities to uh, implement and to reform the, the, the county system. The, during the discussion we had and during the consultations we had with consultants and the donors and partners uh, within, the, within the government itself, uh, how we are going to move ahead with the with the implementation since we were faced with three with three options uh, full adoption uh, of a direct adoption of IPSAS, which would, which should mean prepare a totally new legislative framework and uh, translate it in Albania and implement them as such at a big bank uh, process or follow uh, full but indirect approach of implementing it, just, it should mean to integrate all the requirements of FIPSAS through local uh, government, through local uh, uh, GAP, or the third approach, a partial adoption of FIPSAS to uh, modify the current regulations and legislation and to add new uh, instructions consistent with selected parts of selected FIPSAS. And uh, as I mentioned, taking consideration other countries' experiences, taking consideration the discussion and uh, uh, with consultants, we decided to go for the third option or a partial adoption of IPSAS through uh, local uh, local uh, uh, regulations uh, for several reasons. But I would like to uh, highlight two main two main reasons why we took this decision. Uh, because first of all, uh, when we identified, when we uh, prepared the gap analysis, we identified a lot of consistencies and inconsistencies uh, between the Benin public sector gap and the IPSAS for each time. So there were a lot of elements in IPSAS that were inconsistent with our current context. And at the same time, not all IPSAS standards are relevant for the Benin context. 
and all, all the parts of standard are applicable in the Bayer context. So this was one of the drivers for this decision. And second, uh, as we as we know, it's as our standards that allow accountants to have a broader professional judgment for different accounting cases related to recognition, evaluation, and registration of financial transactions. But in Albania, uh, we have a practice, a standard practice is a rule, a rule based approach, uh, which is which has been consistently applied all time, supported by detailed instructions and guidance from above from the center. Uh, and in this regard, the current approach, we believe that provide accountants with some more concrete, specific, and clear accounting principles to ensure ambiguous understanding of requirements and avoid any inconsistencies during the uh, implementation of the standards. Uh, some of the original uh, IPSAs are not aligned with the local country approach and the cultural, cultural expectations regarding accounting cases. So these were the two main drivers that, we, that, that made us uh, go through this decision. But this doesn't mean that we are not going for a full accrual accounting, but this means that we are going to tailor uh, the requirements of IPSAs uh, in uh, taking consideration the country's context, and of course, definitely taking into consideration the country's stage of development, uh, uh, further elements of IPSAS would be introduced gradually into the, into the, into the system. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And in this regard, we prepared uh, uh, a time, uh, uh, time frame. Uh, how are we going to move with implementation of IPSAS? We have uh, we have uh, plan to move in uh, five phases, uh, as you can see from the from the chart and from the graphic. We have thought at the beginning that the process would take uh, about seven years, but we are already in, in in some delays, and mainly because of the pandemic situation. But uh, still. We are in the first uh, in the first stage where we are working with the uh, translation of IPSAS and the capacity development activities with uh, all the requirements related to the legislative framework. We are amending all the regulations, which by the end of this year actually they will be they will be ready to to be implemented and gradually according to the phases. So as you can see from the uh, from the, from, the, from the picture, we are going to implement all IPSAS uh, issues, but as I, as I mentioned, in uh, tailoring them in the country, in the country context. Uh, but this is a difficult process. Uh, and next slide, please. And uh, we, of course, have faced a lot of challenges, and we are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, Besides the technical uh, fact that okay, we need to uh, uh, deal with uh, some new elements and technical elements, but there are uh, challenges of different types that we have already faced and we might face in the future. Uh, which let's say we have grouped them in, 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 in three main in three main groups. There are first political and managerial challenges. Uh, definitely, accounting reform is not seen to be as politically interesting as budget reforms, as tax reforms, as justice reforms that Albania passed recently. And these are reforms that really attract the attention, but accounting is not a topic that, that, that really attracts the attention of politicians or other uh, uh, actors. Uh, it's really important to uh, have involved in the project the top management of the of the uh, of the key stakeholders to have them engaged actively, uh, so that uh, they take decisions, some political decisions to move things uh, ahead. Uh, a key challenge with political uh, with political challenges is the fact that the, these are reforms that take many years, as you saw from the slide. It takes seven years at least. May take more years. Of course, most countries it has taken most countries it has, it has taken more than ten years to fully uh, reform uh, the accounting. 
the public sector. So these are reforms that take a lot of time. This means that the political uh, political landscape may change the country and maintaining uh, the momentum or maintaining the political support is still a big challenge in terms of the, 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 the time frame. And we, we need to keep the uh, political uh, involvement, we, keep, we need to keep the poli uh, politicians or the higher management really involved and engaged uh, uh, during all this process. Uh, in order to support the to support the activities, then we have the structural challenges. Uh, of course, this is not the process that a reform that can be implemented by the Ministry of Finance itself. Uh, this needs the involvement of many stakeholders, including other ministries, including other independent institutions, including universities, including uh, professional accounts organizations. All these other external uh, stakeholders, but uh, this brings a challenge uh, itself because I mean these are all institutions that uh, or organizations that they have their own limited resources. They might have even their own agendas, which might like, be diverging with the agendas of the government. So it's really difficult a challenge to motivate these stakeholders to manage them and uh, uh, take their commitment to uh, to move ahead with the reforms. And this is also related with the resistance that these uh, reforms uh, might, uh, let's say, bring from stakeholders because we mean significant changes to them. Uh, it means that, uh, let's say, external stakeholders, for example, universities uh, themselves, they might need to change their curricula, but they, are, they have their own, they are independent, they have their own processes of changing curricula, but in this regard, uh, the government, with their support, or the, uh, this is a joint effort to increase, let's say, the capacities for public accountants in the country. And uh, a lot of other changes that come from the institution themselves, of the staff of the institution, that the reform, this kind of reform, which are really technical, and where people sometimes might not see, might not see very clearly, and might not understand the benefits. Of course, uh, uh, they will resist and this kind of reforms that might be uh, perceptive as in, uh, reforms that bring Add to the over uh, to the work to the overload of the work of the people. So definitely, these bring a lot of challenges that need to be managed and a lot of resistance. And then there are the capacity challenges. When we uh, when we started this reform in the country, we would find very few experts that would have the necessary knowledge to uh, help us. Uh, uh, in implementing it, like knowledge in accrual account. And of course, knowledge in accrual account exists in the private sector and the public sector, which is, is totally a new concept. Uh, the expertise is missing. And this is true not only at the, uh, let's say, implementation level with finance, finance uh, officials work, uh, do they daily work, but this is true also for the Ministry of Finance itself, where right? these capacities. The, the Ministry of Finance, which is the leader of the reform, these capacities were, 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 were missing. And uh, this, we had to tackle with this as well. And uh, we, need, we had to, uh, to, uh, to find the necessary capacity, uh, capacities in the institutions that could help to move ahead uh, the reform. Uh, next slide, please. So in this, in this situation, uh, we, uh, let's say, try to uh, identify some techniques how to deal with these challenges, uh, how, to, how to solve some of them that we have faced direct, directly during the implementation or some of them that we knew beforehand that were there. Uh, so we took, uh, we took some measures in order to uh, at least overcome some of these challenges and uh, that we are facing and the, 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 the future challenges, of course, will be there. Uh, and one of the one of the main documents prepared was a management strategy, change management strategy. 
uh, and not only prepare a document of management strategy, but the challenge was also to implement the strategy. We started to prepare the change management strategy, and we also uh, tried to uh, implement the strategy in order to inform all the relevant parties, as I said, to hire them, management, politicians, keep them involved and informed all the time. A continuous communication engagement was crucial in this process. I mean, we, as I said, we we were there all the time, Valerie, even sometimes Valerie and the politicians with the, with the information. We had to show them also, of course, during these stages, some, some quick wins, you know, to make them interested to, uh, in the process. Uh, but besides the politicians and the stakeholders, we try to communicate and we engage with the stakeholders during the all, all the processes that related to implementation. We, uh, we made them part of the project management structures. Uh, we we established a steering committee and we involved all these stakeholders, starting from uh, uh, ministry, like ministries, uh, universities, uh, professionals from outsiders, other institutions that are impacted. Uh, from the reform, so we made this part of the of the process. Not only a formal, not only formally by placing them or putting them in steering committee, but we involved them in activities, in activities, in uh, the discussion, discussing documents related to the project. Uh, Try as much as we could to uh, to make them part of this of this reform. Uh, the challenge that was related to the uh, uh, capacity building. I mean, even before we we started, uh, even before we started the reform, of when we were planning about the reform and about the project activities related to that, we already knew that the capacities were missing there, and we already uh, started thinking uh, how to identify uh, best possible capacities that we had in our administration that could uh, lead technically the, the process. Uh, and we identified the project implementation team uh, from the Ministry of Finance, from the uh, main department related with accounting methodology and, uh, the, and implementation, which is the Treasury. And we started training these people beforehand, even before the, uh, the, the, the reform activities started. And uh, started working with these people firstly and to increase the capacities with these people and uh, uh, we tried to establish a team that had the most capacity at the, at the situation that we were and we, 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 we did several training with them with uh, with support of World Bank of course, with ACCA, with SIPA, uh, and with uh, this uh, international institutions in order to build the capacities first with the Minister of Finance. And then, of course, a part of the then reform activities were we undertook a lot of training activities for other, for other uh, finance officials, for a wider, for a wider community. Uh, and of course, an, for, an, an, important, an important part in this process Next, uh, next time is that help us a lot is also the involvement of the of the external partners. Uh, we have had close cooperation with uh, with World Bank, with donors, with other international, uh, with EU partners here in in, in country to uh, use them as a driver to push the reform, especially at the political and high management level, and to raise awareness. Uh, keep them involved and uh, and uh, keep them uh, uh, informed in the in the process and we have been persistent and resilient and engaged to work closely with the uh, with the partners and we are bank uh, with world bank team uh, in the country which are supported directly with the project for example and not only but beyond so that uh, and uh, as I mentioned, from, uh, active communication, formal and informal with all the, with all the, parties, uh, the parties involved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, we also have to keep in mind, though, that this is, uh, I mean, accounting reform is not just an executive, a better qualitative financial reporting 
is not just an objective per se. A high productive financial information is is uh, is cornerstone for well functioning public sector and for providing high quality services and uh, deliver value for money. And this does not come, uh, this kind of reforms cannot be implemented alone and separated from other initiatives that, uh, that uh, the government is undertaking. As I mentioned, the county reform is part of the PFM strategy of the country. It's related with other uh, initiatives that the country is committed to undertake, uh, such as the compilation of a fixed asset register. So this is some of the uh, activities already foreseen and planned to be undertaken. Uh, the, uh, the the IT system, the financial management system of the country, as well as the web-based interface for budgeting purposes, these are reforms that uh, we are keeping in mind to uh, to fit with the kind of reform. The uh, payroll system, uh, HR system, IT system for management of uh, human resources. Uh, the arrears management system that we invented, and these are all the initiatives that we are taking in consideration in order to um, have to facilitate the implementation of uh, public accounting reform. And uh, next slide, please. And by the end of this, uh, by the end of this process, we expect to have some. Uh, Financial statements in accordance with uh, uh, with selected us. Uh, we expect to have some improved qualitative accounting uh, information, statistical information, and financial report information. We expect to have uh, increased capacity in the Ministry of Finance, the financial reporting unit, who is in charge of uh, let's say consolidation rules for the government. Uh, the Central uh, Organization Union is in charge of public accounting methodology, not only uh, uh, not only preparing methodology, but how to monitor implementation and how to uh, find the mechanisms to uh, deliver the capacity building activities in a continuous manner in order to uh, keep the necessary uh, level of expertise in the in the all levels of public units. Uh, and definitely, uh, this would lead to a sustainable public sector economic quantification process. It should, should be in line with good international practices and definitely uh, would improve the understanding of practitioners as well as the uh, public sector auditors. Uh, and greater awareness of the benefits of improved sector accounting and financial reporting by stakeholders, which I mentioned, government officials, politicians, media, civil society organizations. So definitely, these groups will have um, better uh, and improved information, which should serve them to, as I mentioned before, to, uh, to scrutinize the, the government's the government's activity. Uh, and in, in the end, the last slide. Uh, I'm just showing the, who are the main the main stakeholders of this and how uh, how we work with them and as I said we try to keep them involved and the the principal stakeholder of course is the Ministry of Finance uh, the eyes users of public funds in the Institute of Statistics and civil institution but these are not alone as I said uh, all. Uh, all uh, the implementing units, they are part of the reform of public units. Uh, World Bank, with its own activities, is one of the stakeholders which is helping us to push forward the, the, the reforms and, as I mentioned, the, the project management structures in, the, in, the, in establishing the country to uh, move ahead the, the reform. So thank you, thank you everyone. This was uh, in general uh, some uh, some information where we stand right now, and uh, I'll be really happy. Hope you find it useful, and I'll be really happy to answer uh, any question that, that you might have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dritan Firoze again. Jose, I understand we have 
uh, several questions, so we can yes. go with you now. Thanks so much, Dimitri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fino, for such an interesting presentation on the Albania experience. And um, uh, we have two questions, but they were uh, mostly um, answered during the, the last part of the, of the presentation. But I would like to ask you back if you have a specific point to uh, underline uh, regarding the challenges. The first one is the capacity challenges. And uh, uh, you you mentioned several ways where capacity challenges are being addressed. But if you had to uh, pick one main aspect of this challenge, what would be and uh, how, how, how it's being addressed? And the second one is on the international, uh, sorry, in, uh, on the financial management information system. Also, um, uh, it, it looks like it's under development and you have uh, lots of uh, stakeholders for this to happen um, in, in a good way, but also would like to hear from you what's the main challenge that you see regarding the, develop, the, the development of the financial management information system. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, regarding the capacity challenging, uh, challenges, which uh, I, I mentioned yeah, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, one of the main important things with the capacity challenge, uh, which I mentioned a little bit, but I'd like to emphasize, was the fact that the expertise in the country for, uh, for uh, IPSAS, or cruel accounting, special public sector, was missing. Uh, and uh, we, we all, all of this is very fun and they, 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 they take that, they take some time. And we already have the hearing now some trainings. It's been uh, more than one year now that we are working on, the, on, on providing trainings for why the community of finance is ready to, uh, first of all, to raise awareness about themselves and to, uh, to, uh, let's say introduce certain level of success these are many basic uh, basic uh, trainings that we are doing for most of the finance officials in the country uh, the challenge here is to keep this training going on i mean these are not project activities we, we have support now for project activities but once the project activity ends uh, it shouldn't mean that the training should end and this knowledge that is received should end should be ended so that's why we are taking measures and we need to, to, uh, to tackle the capacity challenges issue since the beginning. And this is the project we are following. And that's why I mentioned at the beginning that we are working firstly with universities to update their curricula uh, in order to include more uh, subjects related to public finance management and to public sector accounting for their students in order to, for the near future, to establish some uh, capable expertise in the country that would serve the public sector, of course. Uh, next, we are thinking of mechanisms to establish uh, uh, some resources or some capacities in the government itself, but not only the government, or the professional organizations as well, to be able to provide continuous training uh, on this area. So it doesn't have to be the government to, to deliver them, of course, the professionalization universities themselves have capacities. So we are working now with the consultants to uh, establish some such mechanisms to keep the trainings uh, going on in this area uh, and to try to deliver the trainings uh, continuously. So these are the, the main elements and this is the project we're following regarding the, uh, the, the, the capacity building. By the end of this year, actually, I expect that at least with universities, we should have made some updates in their curricula. We are working closely with them, uh, with academia, and uh, we will have a clear view by the end of this year how the um, uh, mechanism for continuous development will be developed. Uh, what would be the role of government? What would be the role, the role of professional organizations? Which, as I, as I mentioned, they are already part and they are already being involved in uh, increasing their own capacities on this. Uh, 
and uh, of course on on, on learning uh, uh, about the class as well as increasing the capacities of the trains. I forgot to mention that uh, we have already trained, already trained uh, besides the trains that we did earlier, we have already trained uh, some, I would say, the, the, the best people we could identify from all stakeholders, uh, including uh, ministries, uh, universities, uh, professional organizations. We have already brought them together and we have already trained this group of people that's, uh, that they would serve uh, not only as uh, uh, leaders of promoting the implementation just in their organizations or in their institutions, but at the same time, they serve as key partners for us in the ministry to uh, help to deliver the messages and, of course, to organize trainings for, for themselves. Uh, and as for the ID system, of course, this is uh, this is a crucial a crucial element uh, in facilitating the uh, the implementation of this. Uh, we uh, we are already uh, working on on identifying the deficiencies in the system. Actually, as a matter of fact, the system uh, the system that we have, which is an Oracle based system. Uh, is a modern system. It would allow for uh, certain elements of accrual of counting, especially in terms of counting. Uh, and uh, it might need minor, minor, uh, let's say, adjustments. Uh, and this is what we are doing now. We are identifying what kind of adjustments should be needed in a system to allow uh, to update the channel of accounts until now the the cruel the cruel uh, uh, recordings and uh, then the the decision set to allow and then the challenge the next challenge the system is that uh, how would all the public units then use the systems currently we have a centralized treasury system which is the, the, the recordings are done through the active system in the treasury and the institution themselves have uh, and not all these institutions have access to all parts of the system, but this is some technical issue which might uh, need to be solved, might be extensive because of some licenses that might be needed and some would require some more resources on the government of this, but this is uh, solvable. So definitely we are working with the IT in order to make it ready to uh, uh, implement and facilitate the implementation of IPSAS. We are considering this period of the reform now as, uh, as making ready the infrastructure uh, in terms of capacity building and in terms of IT. So then we start starting uh, as soon as we finish also the, 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 the other thing, we're starting gradually implementing IPSAS. Uh, and of course, the continuous support for training, those are training and the continuous support for uh, for uh, the improvement of IT systems would, uh, would be needed and uh, uh, we, we will have it in, uh, in our, uh, we'll be, we are aware of that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive answer and also from the education uh, community of practice, we are also ready to, to support um, as, as much as possible uh, as we are doing. Um, I would like to, to take a question from the panelists and uh, if, if there are no questions from the panelists, we can go to one question, a uh, live question from the, from the audience. So uh, if any panelist uh, wants to ask a question, this is the time. Otherwise, we're going to go to, the, to Christian uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in the attendees. There's a question from Natalia. Okay, yes, please go ahead, Natalia. Uh, now there is a question from Natalia Rusakevich, uh, I think, uh, in, in the chat. Uh, and it's in Russian, so I will translate it uh, because the floor is in English. So basically, uh, not, uh, the question is addressed to Firuza. 
And Natalia asks is if the uh, rules on public sector accounting are available in English or Russian and if they are available in open access so that uh, participants from other countries may uh, get familiar with them. Firuza, if, if you are with, uh, Firuza, если вы еще подключены, можете ли вы ответить на этот вопрос? А вы есть. Вот у нас эти правила на азербайджанском языке. Yes, so these rules are in Azeri language. This is a huge book. Not in Russian, for sure, but I don't think um, these rules are in English. But maybe you could use Google Translate. Or I can send you these rules, but then you can give that to translators to uh, make an official translation into Russian or English. Um, can we um, promote Christian to panelists so he can uh, do the, the live question? Just a second. Is it Christian? Uh, uh, Christian, if you are speaking, you are muted. Uh, there's a hand raised. Okay, if if it's not uh, able to connect, Christian, uh, back to you, Dimitri. If you want to to um, to ask any final questions, otherwise we'll continue. Uh, Christian, maybe if you can send your question in chat, as you may not be able to have a microphone. Actually, I have ac I activated, but maybe Christian, it was erroneous. Oh yes, the, the hand is down now, so we can we can proceed, yeah. Dimitri. Thank you, Jose. Let's go to Arman for the closing remarks because we're almost running out of time. Arman, thanks. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Jose, and our uh, dear panelists. Uh, uh, it was very interesting a session, another Pulsar session of uh, FinCOP and EDUCOP joined and to present the, uh, the book, uh, our uh, book, uh, The Status of PSA Reforms. It was quite an, a, a insightful also to hear again on from the International Public Sector Financial Accountability Index 2021 the status report and how they are rec uh, reconciled with the, the book, uh, particularly uh, about the drawing, uh, uh, hardly drawing the line between the cash and partial accrual. Uh, and uh, uh, the challenges is uh, how to reach out uh, the right people just to collect the information. But overall, the status is uh, global status is 40% uh, partial and 30% accrual. And uh, the global trend by 2025 is 50% accrual and 2030 projection 73% accrual. So how this connects with Pulsar, as we heard today uh, in Pulsar now, in Pulsar 14 countries or 12 countries, which are covered by the book. Partial accrual is 57% and accrual is 29%. While the trend in Pulsar countries is overall connects with the global forecast and trends, uh, the expectation is that uh, the Pulsar countries are going to speed up with the IPSAS implementation. Uh, at the same time, we have heard that the uh, uh, Pulsar book shows direct and indirect methods of adoption. Uh, and we all, also heard different uh, challenges with direct versus indirect uh, adoption, uh, easier the beginning versus implementation with Ipsos versus, indi versus indirect uh, uh, and implementation. Uh, the, what was just repeatedly mentioned that direct link, there is a direct link of country economic activity and application of accrual. And we have heard also from country cases today what was also very important, it was highlighted by the book itself. It's also from Albania and Azerbaijan experience is improved of quality of public finance, but public service delivery, fiscal stability, economic growth, and of course, credibility of governments. 
so here uh, we can uh, the key challenges which were discussed were uh, the capacity and staff training and it was interesting to learn from Albanian experience how they are training the staff in Azerbaijan what is the certification of chief accountants it uh, was repeatedly referred to the IT infrastructure and IFMS and that is uh, where Azerbaijan is already applying their IFMS system for accrual accounting and Albania is in the process of FMS uh, uh, integration and development and completion. Cost of reform implementation coordination were also highlighted as key challenge and cost on not only financial but resources and time. And of course, uh, institutional resistance was indicated. We are coming back again with the conclusion that political support, management involvement, are the key uh, with the clear reform strategy and realistic timeline to be in place. The governance arrangement is needed for to structure, coordinate, but also to monitor the reform and uh, with linkages to the PFM, uh, uh, other reforms are also critical. So those were also interesting insights we received from the countries, uh, including, uh, as I indicated, uh, the chief accountant certificate in Azerbaijan, IPSAS implement, uh, IFMIS implementation, which support IPSAS, and on Albania, also the link to the Supreme Audit Institution and how they collaborate with Supreme Audit Institution in line with other agencies. Of course, the World Bank provides support and SECO in Albania as well. As, as, a, as a summary, we, uh, we try to repeat, but that is a marathon IPSAS implementation, a true reform that is not a sprint, and we need to continue this journey with the, uh, including with Pulsar program support. Thank you very much, Dimitri, back to you. Thank you, Arman. <clears throat> Colleagues, thank you again for joining us. Please stay safe, enjoy the summer, and have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you.